all right folks so we back all right yeah so I, you'll have to forgive me i just there is no way i can speak properly with constant barking in my head i can't concentrate like that at all and if i'm going through these documents and if i'm going to be explaining things to you all then i want to be able to discuss it properly so where are we at i think hi patrice hi ali i had to put him outside the studio i can't i can't i cannot concentrate with barking in my head the entire time which is why he normally goes walking when i have a life because i just stella stella lays she lies lays down very quietly but he is always on the um he is always in a situation where he is trying to get at Stella to get her to play and that kind of thing. So, right. So, thanks for joining, for rejoining. So, let's, let's, get, let's get right back. Let's get back into it. So, David Lee would have been accused. David Lee would have come out and said immediately, is PNM mischief? To, utter, to, to deflect away from him and having to explain what really was going on with him and that vehicle because he's not planning to explain anything to the public and i mean i'm sure that's the legal advice he has been given and then you had people like kirk and them did i did i did i remember to, yes you had kirk Megu jumping out with this really long winded press release and in that long winded press release there was a very curious paragraph inside here that suggested that if there was a different if there was a different commission of police as in if there was the previous commission of police david lee would not have been arrested and i thought that that was i thought it was very interesting that kirk and the kirk as pro for the united national congress would have put out a press release that implied that the UN, that a unc mp would be getting preferential treatment under a different commission of police so i was like hmm, won't open tory jump out boy so we've often had conversations about salaries and salary increases here and i have often said to folks we should not be judging people's remuneration package I remember when everybody was up in arms about Petrotrin and Petrotrin salaries. We have a habit of judging and envying and wanting other people's salaries without quite understanding what goes into salary negotiations. So I want to start with a couple of things here. This report or this report from the commission, the Salary Reviews Commission, is an important report and it is an important report because MPs in this country don't give themselves salaries. MPs in this country don't give themselves tax exemptions. MPs in this country actually are reliant on the Salary Reviews Commission, which falls under the office of the president, for getting industrial relations representation. So the Salary Reviews Commission that meets however often, I don't know how often they meet, but the last time MPs in this country had any amendments or changes done to their salaries was sometime around 2013, 2014, thereabouts. Actually, maybe roughly the same length of time that public servants have been waiting on negotiations with the government to take place so that public servants would be able to get a salary increase as well. So the Salary Review Commission, they put forward and they make recommendations for things. And because government ministers in this country are essentially CEOs and members of parliament are also essentially CEOs, they're doing a lot of managerial things. They are coordinating different entities in this country because they are doing things like that. And because they are often in positions where, whether as government ministers or as senators as, and as MPs, they can be um, liable or susceptible to corruption, to bribery and those kinds of things, you have to give them 
remuneration packages or salaries that will um, co compensate them adequately and so therefore and so limit the susceptibility to corruption that's the that's the thinking right but MP sal exact correct Diane Clark and all MP salaries are small a member of Parliament makes about twenty thousand dollars and I know for some persons for many homes actually a salary of twenty thousand dollars or a little over twenty thousand dollars sounds like a huge salary but then you need to take into consideration the kind of work that a member of parliament has to be doing and what people need to bear in mind is simply this if you want to be able to make the same kind of salary that an mp is making then you could put yourself up put yourself out there to become an mp the life of an mp is not an easy one they're constantly in the public eye public glare taking public criticism so i can understand that the i can understand why it is necessary and important to remunerate them properly so the salary reviews commission covers let me tell you let me show you some of the things that it let's so show you some of the offices that it covers from the office of the president all the way down to local government officials, right? So you have the, the judiciary, the ombudsman, the auditor general, industrial court, tax appeal board, um, various complaints authorities, and 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 state um, and um, check and balances um, entities like the equal opportunities, the equal opportunities tribunal, um, management level of the public service. All of those things are covered by the salary reviews commission. And the reason I lay in the groundwork here with respect to this is that I want you all to understand that what David Lee is trying to make out to be a political witch hunt is not actually a witch hunt. It is not a witch hunt at all. And it is not a political issue. Rather, it is about tax evasion and tax fraud. And when you consider the taxes is the taxes are how we make 90 percent of our revenue here people who are attempting to evade taxes or to defraud the government through taxes need to be held to account worse than that if you are a member of parliament if you are part of our legislature if you are one of those persons who getting up in Parliament, when do we come to discuss, to debate legislation? If you are a person who's, who has sworn in and, and, and promised to uphold the laws of Trinidad and Tobago, you can't be in a position where you are also breaking the laws of Trinidad and Tobago. So in the salary reviews commission report there is a whole subsection on page nine about tax duty tax and duty exemptions where motor vehicles are concerned and one of the reasons they have the salary reviews commission has made um provisions for tax and duties to be removed from motor vehicles is of course to ensure that people who are doing the job of the people right doing the job of the public doing public work are in a position where they have safe transportation to take them about to do their jobs because we have had a history of um other kinds of corrupt be behavior here where government um government workers have been taking state vehicles home for their personal use damaging state vehicles mashing up state vehicles i don't do you all remember when anna roberts was driving a state vehicle and get got into an accident with it with it on the, on the highway and then after getting into an accident with we'll call for a next state vehicle i think it was a prado that he damaged and then he, he called for an next prado to come and pick him up so the issue here is you don't want a situation where government vehicles that have been purchased for the purpose of government work government related work are then being carried home by persons for private reasons so the salary reviews commission would have made recommendations that you have exemptions in there to make it possible 
for all of these officials that are doing work on behalf of the public sector to have reliable vehicles that they can move around in when they are doing their jobs. And of course, if you are in a situation where the state has provide has provided this kind of incentive for you, it makes you or it should make you less liable to be bribed by somebody else with a car. So that's the thinking behind this. I'm trying to make sure that you all understand the thinking behind the, the tax, the motor vehicle tax exemption. Because it's one thing to sit down and get vexed that people have this tax exemption and people can, can get vehicles without having to pay the taxes. But you need to understand why the tax exemption has been put in place. It's been put in place to allow people to be able to do their jobs effectively. And it has also been put in place to put people in a position where they don't have to be susceptible to bribe, to bribery. Because if I am a public official, let me say I'm an MP, right? And very soon I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be talking about me as an MP. But let me say I as an MP. And I have to be driving all around my constituency, right? So let me say the, I, the constituency of Facebook Central. And I don't have a good car. And my salary, my MP salary is the, 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 the salary that it is, which is a little 20, you know, 20, 20, no more than $25,000. $25,000 a month. So I have mortgage to pay. I have, you know, other, you know, other regular bills, etc., etc., etc. And I have a vehicle and the vehicle taking plenty pong, plenty wear and tear. You don't think I would be susceptible to somebody coming to me and saying to me, hey, we could give you a car for half a million dollars, you know. We could give you a, a nice luxury SUV to move wrong in when you have to go and do events. So the idea is to put me in a position where if somebody comes to me and says that to me, I can then say to them, hey, the state is already offering me an exemption. I am already in a position where I can go and get myself a vehicle that is worth that or, you know, a high end vehicle and not have to be worried about whether or not I can afford the high end vehicle. And here's the interesting thing. The state doesn't just provide an exemption. The state also provides loans and loan facilities for the MPs to be able to go and make the purchase of the vehicle. If they don't have all of the money to make the purchase of the vehicle, they even, are, they even have access to loans to be able to purchase the vehicle. And, uh, and of course, you know, there is the exemption as well. So that is, I wanted to explain that. Now, one of the other things two that I noticed this week. The Mark Bus, David Lee come out. You ain't hear a word from this woman. Kamala has not said a word yet. I am assuming that the first time Kamala is going to speak about this will be on Monday night. She will come out at the forum and speak at the forum because the forum is a safe space. At the forum, she will be able to discuss this and she won't have to worry about questions or feedback from negative feedback from people. Why? Because thus far, the tradition of the parliament here, whether you're on the PNM side or you're on the opposition side, the, 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 the practice has been when an MP gets charged, when a member of parliament gets charged, they are relieved of their duties. You can't fire them as MP, but you can relieve them of their duties. So a senator was charged, Gerald Ramdeen was charged. He was removed as a senator. Um, Marlene McDonough was charged. She had her um, ministerial portfolio stripped from her. When Daryl Smith came into disrepute, he also had his ministerial portfolio stripped from him. David Lee continues to be the chief whip for the opposition. So I'm waiting to see if he is going to be removed as a, as the chief whip and whether or not the United National Congress is going to ask him to resign. I'm not holding my breath. I don't think that they're going to ask him to resign, but we will see. So maybe on Monday night, Kamala will speak out. But the other angle that the United National Congress has come with is to 
do the false equivalency thing between Faris and David Lee. So they've said that Faris and the, that the PNM through via Faris Al Rawi has done the same thing as David Lee. And I want to say this: that is not the case. And let me explain why it is not the case. David Lee bought a vehicle, according to the details of the story, bought a vehicle in 2019, right? And based on the charges that have been laid, what they are claiming is that MP Lee brought the vehicle in may not necessarily have paid for the vehicle he may not have been the person to pay for the vehicle and he got the exemptions and now somebody else is driving the vehicle and this all happened under a two-year period minister al rawi would have bought his vehicle in what is it 2016. he kept the vehicle owned the vehicle used the vehicle for more than two years and what two years is, becomes important in a little bit i'm going to explain to you in a little bit why two years is important would have used the vehicle for more than two years and then after two years had passed well more than two years i think it might have been more, three years had passed he then sold the vehicle to a colleague of his roger k walsing who we know sat on the police service commission and they did not transfer ownership of the vehicle so the breach there was not conspiracy to defraud the state. The breach there was not an attempt to avoid paying taxes. The breach there was not having transferred the vehicle completely. And strangely enough, it is not a new breach. When I say it's not a new breach, it is something. Oh, thank you very much, Beach. So he sold the vehicle in 2016, but he had the vehicle for about three years prior to selling it. So somewhere around 2012, 2013 is when he would have purchased the vehicle and more than two years would have passed and then he sold the vehicle in 2016. so it, he certainly had the vehicle for more than two years and he'd only once at the two year period has passed he could sell the vehicle so faris sold his vehicle did not transfer the vehicle from his name to k wal singh's name entirely and so there is a fine for that that's a breach of that's a breach of some part of the motor vehicle the motor vehicle act david lee and hugh leong poi are alleged to have attempted to avoid paying taxes and it is more than a million dollars in taxes so let's get into this exemption the motor vehicle exemption that not just mps um, members of the judiciary, senior members of the um, public service, all have access to. Works this way. You have the option of an exemption of customs, VAT. It's customs, VAT, and motor vehicle tax, to the best of my knowledge. Right? So there are three taxes. Customs tax, motor vehicle tax, and um vat right so yes so vat motor vehicle customs tax and <clears throat> the vehicle was not transferred entirely Earl dj trace the crowd mitchell it wasn't transferred entirely there was also a lot of noise at, at last year about the vehicle and whether the vehicle had been properly transferred and the and minister al rawi had to come out and explain a number of things and talk about um having a slip and whether or not he did what he was supposed to have done and whether it happened in time he didn't it was not transferred properly right and not is not something i'm making up so back to the issue of the motor vehicle exemption you are an mp and as an MP, one of the things that you that you have access to, as a matter of fact, let me see if I can pull up. I should be able to pull that up. Let me show you all what what the remuneration package of an MP is. Do I have it here? I should have it here.
Oh, that's odd. I know I put it inside here somewhere. This is just now. Give me a second. Oh, maybe it's just saved on the phone. So you have, as a government minister, because I pulled it out of the Salary Reviews Commission. Right. I have it on. Okay, I had it on my phone. I should be able to send it over real quick. And pull it up on my iPad. Right. I forgot to put, I forgot to put, pull this up. To put this, to set this up. Right. Good. So... Right. So, as a government minister, right? So this would have been from the the Salary Reviews Commission report of around 2012, 2013, thereabouts. You, that's the salary of a, of a member of parliament. And then you have the motor vehicle tax, VAT, customs duty. All right? Those are the three things that you get, that you get off. Motor vehicle tax, VAT, customs duty and it um is up to a particular amount right there is a there will be a limit a, 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 there's a cap so you are, are allowed a loan um at a particular interest rate and you get a cap of up to a certain amount in terms of the motor vehicle tax the vat the customs good and you can you are allowed to access this exemption every two years Every two years, you are allowed to access this exemption. Now, David Lee purchased a vehicle in 20, 2016. I didn't want, want to lie. So let me make sure and pull up that properly. He bought a Benz in 2016. February 2016, he purchased a Benz. And then would have come in, mm, is it March or May? That's not a, and then would have come in May of 2019, yeah, May 2019, to purchase another vehicle. So just, just after, just after the, the two-year span had ended, so after the two-year span had ended, he would have purchased an, a new vehicle. Now, there's nothing illegal about that. He is entirely within his, within, you know, within the laws. Once the two-year window has passed, you can... You could hold on to the vehicle, you could sell the vehicle, and you can apply for a tax exemption again to get another vehicle. Now, I am aware that, you know, in, in Trinidad and Tobago, there are a number of people that have used that two-year window um, to be able to kind of, you know, create like a little cottage industry where they buy a vehicle, they use the vehicle for two years, and then they sell the vehicle, and they make, they make, a, they make a decent profit. And they make a decent profit because they didn't have to pay all of the taxes. But when they sell the vehicle, the price that they sell the vehicle at is the, is the market price. The, pr the price that everybody else would have to pay for the vehicle. And so that way, the monies that they didn't have to pay in, exam in, in exemptions, they make back from having sold the vehicle. Perhaps one of the things that we can look at or should be discussed is extending the length of time. That, the, 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 that two year window and probably make it a three year or four year window so every three years or every four years they could um they could you that's when you sell the vehicle now that's when you can ap apply for a new exemption let me put it that way that's when you can apply for a new exemption so it's every two years you can apply for this exemption what david lee and the united national congress is a is trying to get people to think is that what he did was normal. The issue here is not the two year time period. The issue here is who purchased the vehicle or rather who applied for the tax exemption, who purchased the vehicle, who paid for the vehicle. When I say who purchased the vehicle, who paid for the vehicle and who actually has possession of the vehicle. And since 
these exemptions are meant to be exemptions only for persons who are members of parliament somebody who is not a member of parliament ought not to be in a position where they are able to bypass the system through a member of parliament to be able to buy a high-end luxury vehicle and not pay taxes so let's look at and surely some documents this is documents from a person who i would call mr hardly right so we're going to look at some documents from mr hardly so this is back in february 2016 this is a pro forma invoice let me bring myself up on the screen here a little bit because i need to explain the process to you all if i am an mp so think of me as an mp think of me as miss as mrs hardly right so i'm mp hardly and i am the representative for facebook central and i want to be able to buy a vehicle so i go to one of the local dealerships here indicate this is the kind of this is the type of vehicle i want and what they do is they order the vehicle to come in and let me explain why they will order the vehicle to come in for me vehicles that are already in the showroom that are you know in on the, the, the dealership's compound taxes done paid on those vehicles and because taxes have already been paid on those vehicles you don't get them taxes revoked you don't it it don't happen so you just don't you know they don't retroactively remove the you reimburse the, the dealership for the taxes so all you bear with the barking dog in the background yeah i i, I can't actually give me two seconds You have to sit down quietly, yeah? Right, so I'm back. So, MP Hardly, MP, I'm the MP for Facebook, Facebook Central. <coughs> so I go to a dealer, I go to Sterling Services as an example, and I tell the dealer I want the vehicle. The dealer then decides that he's going to be bringing in the vehicle that I want. And he's bringing in, he's going to be importing the vehicle that I want. Because in importing the vehicle that I want, it gets here without taxes having been applied to the vehicle, right? So when the vehicle, so while the vehicle is being imported, I will, as the MP for Facebook Central, I will fill out a pro forma invoice. I will also fill out an application form like to apply for the exemption and I will put together the pro forma invoice and the application form and I will send it to one of two persons. If I am in government and, the, and a minister in government, I will then submit the pro forma invoice and my application for the exemption to my to the the permanent secretary of the ministry that i am in or if i am an mp who does not have who doesn't have a um a ministry so i'm without a portfolio so i could be on the government side or i could be on the opposition side but i don't have a portfolio i submit the pro forma invoice and the and the application form for the exemption through the clerk of the parliament right and this is why the office of the parliament is very important is one of the reasons the office of the parliament is is important so i as mp hardly would send in those documents and when i fill out those documents and i send those documents in uh, someone in the in either in the line ministry or in the office of the parliament has to do their due diligence go through the application make sure that i make sure that i qualify for the exemption make sure that i am owing the state money somewhere for somehow for something and also make sure that i have not applied for the exemption w within you know under a, a two-year time frame because if i let's say i've been an, an mp for four years 
and I applied. Okay, we're in 2022. Let me say I, I became an MP in 2018. So I applied for an exemption in 2018. And then I applied for an exemption in 2020. And now I'm trying to apply for an exemption again, but it's before the um, but it's before the is before the, the two year time period is up. You have to have somebody either inside of a ministry or inside of the office of the parliament doing the necessary due diligence to ensure that um that I am not breaching I'm not breaching things. So once somebody has done all of those things, the permsec will then sign either the permsec or whoever is the accounting officer. So it could be the clerk of the parliament, it could be a permanent secretary will sign off on those things. And then the documents reach on over to two places the documents are to go to. They are to go to the Border Inland Revenue and they are to go to Customs. Right? Those are the two places that the, 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 the file has the file for the application for the exemption has to go to. Because I have to be exempted from value added tax, motor vehicle tax, and customs duty. You're seeing it right there on the form in front here. Eh? Hold on. Hold on for a second. My screen died here, so I have to. So I have to switch back. I have to switch back to because it went to sleep. Where are we? Right. Sorry about that. So customs duty, motor vehicle tax, and uh, um, where is the other tax boy? And VAT, right? Customs duty, motor vehicle tax, VAT. Those are the three. Those are the three exemptions that that I will get. Now, let me tell all you what Mr. Hardly, what MP Hardly did. I am MP Hardly. I just want you to remember that, right? So, in twenty sixteen, I MP Hardly would have gone to Sterling Services. And I would have purchased a vehicle, a Mercedes-Benz GLA 200. And I would have gotten VAT exemption to the tune of $90,000. I would have gotten motor vehicle tax exemption to the tune of $89,000. I would have gotten customs duty exemption to the tune of $160,832.80. Right? So you see in the various figures there, you could add, up, add it up and you will see how much how much money I get in exemptions. More than $300,000 in exemptions I would have gotten in 2016. But you will notice that you could tell who it is I get the vehicle from. Once the exemptions have been approved, I then take that approval to the dealer and the dealer will then take the exemptions and go down to the port and get the vehicle cleared. Nobody looking to clear the vehicle before them exemptions come through. Because if they look to clear the vehicle before the exemptions come through, it means that they will have to pay customs duty, VAT and motor vehicle, motor vehicle tax, right? So everything, everything hinges on applying for the exemptions, getting the exemptions, and after all of that paperwork sorted out, then they will go and clear the vehicle off the port and bring the vehicle to the showroom. When that happens, when the vehicle get cleared and it come off the port and it reach the showroom, then I will go into the dealership and pay for the cost of the vehicle. Because remember, all of the exemptions have been sorted out. So all I will have to pay will be the actual price, the showroom price of the vehicle. That is, that is the price that I will be paying. And so that's how this tax exemption benefits the office holder. Because if the market price of a vehicle is over $700,000. Hold a second. Eh? Who just posted something on my arm? Can somebody delete this as a donation funds thing, please? And block him? Me and understand that at all. Not in the middle of my life. You're a madman. Right. So if a vehicle 
If the market price of a vehicle is over $700,000 and I am in a position where I get an exemption to the tune of three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars it means that I only have to find four hundred thousand dollars to be able to purchase the vehicle and remember if I don't have the four hundred thousand dollars in cash I can get a loan right the, the state will provide me with a loan to be able to pay off to be able to to, 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 to purchase the vehicle so it works to the benefit of the um, public servant, the, the, the MP, in that the, the price they're paying for the vehicle will not be the full market value of the vehicle. They'll probably end up paying something like half the market value of the vehicle. So, so that was Mr. Hadley back in 20 back in 2016 I want to show you Mr. Hadley in 2019 so Mr. Hadley in 2019 check we out we don't know who the dealer of the vehicle is well I did he I I didn't um I didn't use a local dealer for the vehicle Value added tax, two hundred and ninety-three, almost three hundred thousand dollars was the value added tax. Motor vehicle tax, almost three hundred thousand dollars was the motor vehicle tax. Customs, eight hundred and over eight hundred thousand dollars was the customs tax. So those figures there is what come up to one point four million dollars. But you will notice there is no dealer. So let me tell you what I did to be able to get the car that I want to buy there. I ordered the car myself from a company online, which means I had to find either pounds or US dollars to be able to pay for the vehicle via a wire transfer. And then when the vehicle reach, because all of the exemptions were dealt up with. I just had to go onto the port because I didn't need to send nobody from no dealership onto the port. I done pay for the vehicle via, you know, whatever loan or bank, trans bank transfer I would have done. So I just go onto the port, clear the vehicle because I have all of the exemptions in hand and drive the vehicle off the port. It is important in this process that we don't know, that you don't know who I used as the dealer to get the vehicle. It is important in this process because once you don't know who the dealer is that I would have used, you have no idea when, where, or how payments would have been made for this vehicle. So if I had to be asked questions, if police had to pull me into a station to answer questions, I would have to be showing them banking information and banking evidence. There'd have to be evidence of a wire transfer or evidence of having taken out a loan. Those are the kinds of things that police would have to ask me, MP Hardly, about my purchase of this vehicle. So when Members of the United National Congress are there telling you that this situation with the vehicle is the exact same thing as what happened with Faris and is the exact same thing as Prime Minister Patrick Manning having sold his vehicle or having sold his vehicle however many years ago and somebody who linked to Dolce D purchased the vehicle. No, there are no correlations there at all false equivalencies. What is important to note is there are taxes that everybody does normally have to pay when you're purchasing a vehicle. Those tax exemptions, those taxes have been waived to certain levels of public servants to improve their remuneration package so that they're less susceptible to bribe and bribe taking and corruption. 
And so those exemptions are only meant to be used and utilized by those, those officials, the people who are covered under those exemptions. So if I was to, if I was an MP and I took, ex, I took advantage of those exemptions, but I took advantage of those exemptions for somebody else, not for myself, not for me to do my duties in Facebook Central, but for somebody else, let's say a businessman, a good friend, somebody who may have funded my campaign. If I take advantage of those exemptions for that purpose and allow that person to be able to avoid having to pay those taxes, then I am denying the state taxes. I am defrauding the state of taxes. So I look forward to the case. I'd love to hear the details coming out of the case. I want to hear where everybody, you know, all sides. I want to hear what the prosecution had to say. I want to hear what the defense have to say. I want to hear what exactly went down with the purchase of this vehicle. Who purchased the vehicle? Where they purchased the vehicle? How they purchased the vehicle? And when the vehicle reached here, who exactly have possession of the vehicle? Because there's one thing to say that the vehicle is in your name. Because we know that the, the we, we know the application for the exemption in your name, right? And so the vehicle had to be in your name, and the insurance has to be in your name. But who paid for the vehicle, and who now has possession of the vehicle, right? So those are the things you need to be thinking of when David Lee and Kamla and Kirk Megu and Marsha Walker and them talking about cars and trying to muddy up waters so y'all thanks for spending time with me sorry about the noise from the dogs and thing next week will be a quieter live i promise you enjoy the rest of the evening right, 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 right.